Between March and October 1942, an unexploded parachute mine buried in the Thames foreshore at Woolwich threatened both the Royal Arsenal as well as the ships bringing vital supplies into London's docklands. The mine's recovery and its subsequent disarmament was the responsibility of Lieutenant Charles Tanner. This proved to be a particularly tricky operation earning Tanner the George Medal. Lieutenant Charles Graham Tanner was no stranger to the muddy banks of the River Thames. A mine disposal officer with the Land Incident Section, he had learned his trade in the late summer of 1941 while assisting Australian Lieutenant Geoffrey John Jack Cliff working on three mines that had buried themselves in the soft sludge on the northern banks of the river. In fact, they had come to rest dangerously close to the oil storage tanks at Thames Haven. The importance of this fuel storage area to the war effort was obvious. The mines were buried at depths of up to 16 feet, so it required some considerable engineering skills in order to extract them. This involved the building of coffer dams and bridges. The Royal Engineers helped on occasions such as these, and it was a Lieutenant Lombard of 22 Bomb Disposal Company and his men of 216 BD Section who undertook the excavating and timbering at these incidents. Wally Fielding, a sapper with 22 BD Company, recalled that their unit had a number of conscientious objectors that helped to recover at least one of these mines. It was a long, hard, difficult job, and a wet job. When the hook of the mine parachute shackle was uncovered, one of the lads got a hook on just in time as the shaft filled with water. One of the members of the non-combatant corps was an artist who made oil paintings of the whole event, but they were impounded for the duration. Each of these three mines that Tanner helped work on took between a fortnight and a month to recover. A year later, Tanner found himself in charge of an operation to recover another problem mine that was buried in the Thames foreshore by the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich. It was on the 20th of March 1942 that this mine fell in the Thames off Margaret Ness without exploding. Its discovery was as a result of the parachute being seen on the mud at low water. The parachute was swept ashore on the 30th of March and removed by the police who handed it to the FOEC London. The site was just outside the Woolwich Arsenal's fence, and the Thames was buoyed to seaward to warn shipping to keep clear of the danger area. The seawall where the mine lay was a steep stone embankment rising some 20 feet above the mud level. Each day there was a period of some five hours in which the site was uncovered, with an average depth of about 10 feet of water over it every tide, running at four knots up and down the river. It was assumed that the mine was an active magnetic type MK4 unit, as these mines were being dropped at the date of fall. This mine was a potential danger to not only shipping, but also the seawall and the royal arsenal. It was therefore decided to attempt to remove it, and Lieutenant Tanner was given the job. According to the diary of Number 25 Bomb Disposal Company, Royal Engineers on the 5th of October Two steam sterilizers and eight men were loaned to the Navy in anticipation of sterilization work on the mine. The next day, operations were commenced to locate it. The mine had been buried for the previous six months, so it became a laborious operation of probing in soft mud in which the men sank over their knees. The area the search covered consisted of about 40 square yards per day. After 10 days, the mine was finally located with the tail two feet below the surface of the mud lying at an angle with the bomb fuse underneath. It was therefore necessary to excavate to a depth of about nine feet to deal with the fuse. Lieutenant Tanner, in charge of the operations, was assisted by Lieutenant Roger Ernest Piers and seamen of the land incident section. All of them were fully aware that this mine was most probably in a highly dangerous state and that when the mud was washed clear of the clock, the mine would very possibly detonate. The mine's fuses were actually designed as a self-destruct mechanism to stop them from being recovered. A weight inside was thrown forward on impact. This started a clock that ran for about 17 seconds before detonating the mine. However, if the fuse was immediately covered by at least 8 feet of water, or wet mud, the water pressure would stop the timer before it had fully run down. A separate pressure switch would start another clock in operation that would arm the mine so that it would become sensitive to any changes in the surrounding magnetic field as a result of a ship passing. The weights in the fuse also had a tendency to jam in their groove. This could be because of a speck of dirt or the jolt caused by a mine hitting something solid as opposed to water. 
any subsequent disturbance, however slight, might then cause the weight to move again and start the brief countdown to detonation. This would certainly have been in the minds of those working on the foreshore that day. Lieutenant Tanner's intention was to render the mine safe without moving it. The plan was to make an eight-foot hole, sinking all the runners to their full length in the mud in the form of a coffer dam before starting excavation, jetting the boards down by water pressure. The excavation was done by an ejector pump, but mud was deliberately left under the mine to prevent it moving, and the mine was also supported on a cross strut. As soon as the detonator pocket, which was on top, was clear, Lieutenant Tanner, with the help of able seaman Percy Fouracre, tried to unscrew the bung. However, it was jammed in tight and the tool broke when Tanner applied his full strength. The bung had obviously swollen and was for practical purposes immovable. Excavation went on, and the following day the area for 400 yards was evacuated and shipping diverted to the northern shore. Lieutenant Piers cleared away mud from the underside of the mine to the bomb fuse in order that Tanner could operate with clean hands. Lieutenant Tanner then attempted to render safe the mine. The procedure was to remove a small access plate and insert a gag, which looked like a small pop rivet. This gag was a brass rod that basically had the same effect as water pressure in stopping the timer from running. This could be a fiddly job at the best of times, and often the timer would start as the access plate was removed. Speed was then of the essence, as the mine would detonate in a matter of seconds, if the timer was allowed to run down. On inspection, Tanner found that the bomb fuse was badly corroded right down to the hydrostatic valve, which he could not move in spite of pushing on it with all his strength with a screwdriver. Owing to the corrosion, he could not tell if it was already down. As the only alternative to removing the fuse was burning or steaming out the explosives with the fuse ungagged, he decided he was justified in taking the risk of actually removing it ungagged. This procedure was approved by his superiors. He therefore carefully removed the keep ring and attempted to pull the fuse out from a distance. On five occasions, the cord broke as the fuse was so firmly corroded in. The only way to get a straighter pull from the fuse was to move the mine into a vertical position. First, Tanner removed the magnetic primer. This was in perfect condition and in fact fell out on his face as he lay under the mine. The mine was then pulled vertical and a two-inch block and tackle fitted to the extension ring on the fuse. On pulling this from a distance, the extension ring came off and sheared the threads on the fuse. Fortunately, a steel extension fitting with adjustable jaws was available in the land incident section for this contingency. The next day, this tool was adjusted to fit on what remained of the jammed fuse, the two block and tackle secured, and at a distance, 16 men manned the rope and walked slowly away. The rope tightened hard, and then something appeared to snap. On returning to the mine, Lieutenant Tanner found that the fuse had come out, and he at last successfully rendered the mine safe. On removal of the clock, it was found that the soluble plugs had melted, but the clock had not run off. To emphasize just how dangerous the mine had been, on pressure being applied to the clock, it started immediately, and the battery was in perfect condition. This operation, which appeared almost hopeless at the beginning, lasted for five weeks. The party worked under the most filthy and dangerous conditions, and there was no chance of getting away from the mine should anything have occurred. The fuses, once started, ran for up to 17 seconds. In the book The Danger of UXBs, Lieutenant John Setchell of No. 25 BD Company recalled that once Tanner had rendered the mine safe, he was given the job of steaming the explosives from its casing. This was not without complications in so much as matches were prohibited items within the arsenal and had to be left at the gatehouse. You too notice that none of the men in the photographs of the recovery are smoking, which is quite unusual in these type of photos. It wasn't E until Setchell had got a letter of authority from someone of a very high rank that he could go ahead and light up the paraffin burner used for making the necessary steam. This he could only do while on the foreshore and whilst under the supervision of a security guard, who incidentally chose to supervise through binoculars from half a mile away. The London Gazette of the 16th of April 1943 read, The King has been graciously pleased to approve the award of the George Medal for gallantry and undaunted devotion to duty to temporary lieutenant, Charles Graham Tanner, RNVR. Gazetted at the same time was Four Acre S Award of the British Empire Medal. Tanner's luck was not to last as a year later, 
He was killed along with Abel Seaman Foraker as a result of working on another mine. It was soon after 1 a.m. on the 22nd of September 1943 that a Dornier, due 217 K1 German bomber, U5 plus CM of 4 slash KG2, crashed at Out Newton, Yorkshire. The aircraft was on a mine-laying mission from its base at Deelen in the Netherlands and was flying very low, about 50 feet, when searchlights from Kilnsey and Spurn caught it. As a number of searchlight beams converged on the aircraft, it fired a burst of machine gun fire at them, but to no avail. The aircraft, perhaps with pilot dazzled by the searchlights, flew into the ground at a shallow angle at three-foot lane, approximately 400 yards west of Southfield Farm. It broke up with the wreckage being spread over 250 yards from the impact point. The crew comprising of pilot W. Helmut Rumpf, his observer, FDW Siegfried Bomweg, the wireless operator Giefer Arno Eamann, and the gunner, OBGFR Kurt Stiegler, were all killed. They were later buried in Hull North Cemetery. Found among the wreckage were two unexploded G-type mines and Tanner, who was by then a lieutenant commander, and AB Foraker were sent to deal with them, along with another RNVR officer named Lieutenant Frank Henry Edmund Price. Lieutenant Price was another experienced mine disposal officer. Earlier in the year, he had worked on a particularly difficult mine, his seventh, in the garden of house next to an ordnance factory in Cardiff. The mine in that instance had smashed its way through some concrete slabs, split open, and buried itself eight feet down. On impact, the bomb fuse had been forced inside the body of the mine, and the top of it had sheared off. An official report stated that the clock, firing lever, striker, etc., together with the explosive gain and pickricks, were jammed in the pocket. The fuse was therefore set to run on the slightest vibration, and there was no method of gagging it. As the fuse pocket was exposed, Price immediately pushed his thumb onto the firing lever to prevent any movement and then carefully removed the whole fuse pocket. He had to be lifted from the hole by two assistants while he maintained pressure on the mechanism. Plaster of Paris was then mixed up and poured into the fuse pocket. Until this had set, Price was unable to let go without the risk of the fuse pocket exploding. Had it done so, it would have meant certain death for Price and those around him. Now at the site of the crashed bomber at Out Newton, the men were ready to make an attempt at disarming one of the mines. Though G-mines looked like bombs, they were actually mines. They were designed to be dropped in water and had a magnetic unit in the rear designed to detect shipping. As they had no parachute, they could be aimed far more effectively into the entrances of harbors, for example. These G-mines also contained a fiendish booby trap. Hidden beneath the rear cover were photoelectric cells, if the cover was removed in daylight, the mine would explode. Tanner would have been well aware of this fact. Standard procedure was to work on these mines in subdued lighting, for example at twilight or with the bomb disposal officer and the mine covered by a sheet of tarpaulin. Other booby traps could also be found in mines, such as a mechanical switch that would operate if a stud holding the rear cover was unscrewed. The exact circumstances are not known, but it can be assumed that this mine had a booby trap such as this, as at around noon on the 22nd of September the mine suddenly exploded. The Admiralty were informed of the bad news. Tanner was dead and Foraker and Price were seriously wounded. They were taken to nearby Withernsey Convalescent Hospital for emergency treatment, but Foraker quickly succumbed to his injuries. Though Price was badly injured, he did survive and was quickly transferred to the Beverly Base Hospital, an ex-workhouse in East Riding, Yorkshire. The same afternoon, another mine disposal expert, Lieutenant Commander Ernest Gidden, was flown by the RAF from London, Hendon, one degree to assess the situation Lee and deal with the remaining mine. He found the mine was lying about 200 yards from the enormous crater where the other one had been. Tanner's driver stated that he had been sheltering in a ditch at the bottom end of the field at the time of the explosion, but confirmed that Tanner had been carrying out standard procedure. He went on to say that Tanner appeared to have no inkling of trouble when the mine suddenly detonated. The explosion was also witnessed by a number of schoolboys. They had heard about the crash and had cycled five miles to the site and were walking across the fields towards the aircraft wreckage when the mine went up. One of the boys later described how there were lumps of earth and shrapnel flying around. They ran away at this point but returned the following day, and a group of about 16 lads managed to steal a number of items from the wreck 
that they had approached by sneaking along ditches. They actually found no guards were present. Perhaps they had withdrawn to safe distance due to the danger from the other mine that was still sitting in the field. At least one of the boys believed he had clambered over this mine while looking for souvenirs. Items removed by the lads included a Luger, a machine gun, and a cannon along with some ammunition. These were hidden in bushes until another return trip after dark could be made. Later they were moved to another hiding place, the pulley room in Withernsea St. Nicholas Church Tower, above the Bell Ringer S Chamber, and below the Belfry. Most of the boys were in the church choir, and knew that the church bells would only have been used in the event of an invasion. Later they apparently test fired the guns on the beach taking the precaution of attaching a piece of string to the triggers and pulling from a safe distance. The intention was to take the guns to the top of the church tower at night and shoot down a German raider. However, before this plan could be put into action the authorities tracked down where all this missing weaponry had gone and the boys all ended up in court. On arrival at the crash site, Lieutenant Commander Gidden closely examined the second mine and found that the casing had some colored paint marks that he had not seen before. He phoned his CO, Captain Curry, and it was agreed that the mine would be x-rayed as it was likely that it contained a booby trap. George Cross Holder, Lieutenant Commander Armitage, was sent with an x-ray van to undertake this task. It was while waiting for this van to arrive that the schoolboys possibly managed to access the crash site. It was another three days before the x-rays were completed and it was possible to analyze their contents. As a result of these, it was possible to dismantle the second mine without incident. Lieutenant Commander Tanner's remains were laid to rest near the family home at Tilford All Saints Churchyard close to Farnham, Surrey. A plaque was fixed close to the west door to the church which stated, This porch and door were restored in 1948 in memory of Charles Edward Tanner, M.D., F.R.C.S., beloved physician. Born 1861, died 1934, and of his son Charles Graham Tanner, G.M.R.N.V.R., age 35, killed in action, 1943, undefeated, .15 in 2011, a memorial plaque was also put up in the chapel of Tanner's old school, Marlborough College. Abel Seaman Four Care was also buried close to his family home at West Buckland St. Mary's Churchyard in Somerset. Tanner's medals, a group of four including his George Medal, Atlantic Star, 1939-45 Star and War. Medal, sold in recent years for £4,000. Lieutenant Price was also later rewarded, being appointed an MBE for great bravery and steadfast devotion to duty.